Good morning. I'm delighted to be here in Sydney and am honored to have been invited to present the international keynote. So I want to thank Annette Woods, as you know, president of AARE, and Georgina Barton, program chair, for inviting me, and also for arranging some really wonderful opportunities this past week and into the rest of this week for me to exchange ideas with colleagues in Melbourne, in Adelaide, and here in Sydney. As you can see, my rather long title for this morning is Reclaiming Teacher Education Accountability for the Democratic Project, Now More Than Ever. Before I begin, I want to make two caveats. My presentation comes from the work of the research group Project TEAR, Teacher Education and Education Reform, and from our recent book, Reclaiming Accountability in Teacher Education, and you have some discreetly placed flyers for this at your seats. I also want to make another note about um, sources, and that is that all of the scholars' work that I'm going to mention today, all of them are referenced in the book, but we've also created a bibliography for all of those references in case anybody's interested, and that's available as a document on my uh, own website, which is simply marilyncochransmith.com. So if you want the references, you can find them there. The second note is about context. This presentation draws its examples and conclusions from the US context, which is, of course, not the Australian context when it comes to teacher education accountability. But we're all living in the wake of the global shift to a knowledge economy with unprecedented attention to teacher quality and many new expectations about teacher preparation and workforce preparation. The context we share also includes income inequality and gaps in the educational opportunities and outcomes of historically privileged and disadvantaged groups. With these things in common, I think you will find at least some of what I'm going to talk about is very relevant to the Australian context. So I invite you to think about, the, about US teacher education as a provocation and as a kind of cautionary tale when it comes to accountability. And as many people in this room know very well, there are many things to be cautious about right now. So I've organized this talk around three fairly simply phrased, but actually very complex questions. In terms of teacher education accountability, where are we? How did we get here? And where do we need to be? The first question is empirical. Using a policy studies approach, particularly frame analysis, and when I say we, I will mostly mean the research group that I refer to, we analyzed the major national level accountability policies and initiatives in the US in terms of their history and discourse, their underlying assumptions, and the presence or absence of evidence indicating that the initiatives actually have the capacity to meet their stated aims. The second question is also empirical. Here we used a historical approach, focusing on the professional, policy, and political discourse about teacher education and education reform that we had collected in a repository of documents from the 1990s onward. The third question is different. The third question is a normative question, whose answer is based explicitly and intentionally on values, ideals, and goals. This question gets at the power and politics of accountability and the promise of democratic education. In the US, for at least the last two decades, accountability has been the major policy approach to improving teacher education and teacher quality. It's important to note, however, that this idea of holding teacher education accountable is not a single or unitary concept. Rather, there are multiple coexisting accountability initiatives, 
and there are multiple, sometimes competing, accountability demands and expectations. And these play out differently when different regulatory, professional, and advocacy organizations are involved. I'm gonna focus on just the major national accountability policies or initiatives in the US for a minute. So although each of the 50 US states has its own accountability procedures for evaluating teacher education institutions, over the last two decades, there has been a growing federal role. This interplay has been described by some people as a tug of war between the states and the federal government for control of teacher education and teacher quality. In addition, the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation, or CAPE, which became the sole national accreditor as of 2013, and I think some of you probably know its predecessor, NCATE. So that organization also has a set of standards to which all programs seeking national accreditation are accountable. And it's worth noting that national professional accreditation is voluntary in 36 of the 50 US states and mandatory in 14. State level accreditation is required in all 50 of the states. However, in addition, the National Council for Teacher Quality, or NCTQ, a private advocacy organization with no regulatory or professional official role, and with an historically anti-university teacher education agenda, has been grading all teacher education programs A to F according to their own standards, which were not vetted by the professional organization, and then widely publishing, publicizing the results, first in US News and World Report, then in glossy reports delivered to the desks of university presidents. But there's more. Finally, many states now require teacher candidates to pass a teacher performance assessment prior to initial licensure. The biggest of these, EdTPA, is now either required or used in at least one program in 40 of the 50 states. Some states require a different teacher performance assessment, but many require something. In short, the teacher education accountability scene is a thick web of multiple overlapping accountability relationships, which Ramzek tells us is common in advanced Western democracies and other democracies, I imagine, in education and in the public sector. So to try to sort out the multiple and overlapping accountability relationships in teacher education, we drew on the cross-disciplinary accountability, accountability literature and on our own policy analyses. And we developed an accountability framework for teacher education with eight dimensions. Values, purpose, concepts, what we called the diagnostic dimension, the prognostic dimension, control, content, and consequences. Then we clustered these into themes. So the first three dimensions constitute the foundations of accountability, or the underlying values, ideals, purposes, and ideologies of any given accountability initiative or policy. The next two focus on what we call the problem of teacher education, or how the advocates of particular accountability schemes diagnose and frame teacher education as a problem, and then how they construct the prognosis or solution to that problem. The last three dimensions make up what we call power relationships, which gets at the politics of accountability, including who has the authority to stipulate and enforce expectations, who participates in decisions about standards, what counts as evidence that whatever the expectations are, are actually being met, and what the intended 
and unintended consequences are. Unpacking these eight dimensions reveals the theory of change underlying any accountability initiative or policy and also tells us something about its consistency or not with the larger democratic project. And I'm going to come back to that in a while. Based on hundreds of policy documents, policy tools, position statements, editorials, media postings, critiques, and research, we analyzed the four major national accountability initiatives in the US, and you see them down the left column there, in terms of our eight-dimensional framework, which you see across the top. Then, working at the cluster level, we analyzed across the four. We found that, despite differences, and there are many, the major accountability initiatives have core similarities and cross-cutting themes that constitute a dominant accountability paradigm. Although this paradigm has myriad failings and a stunning lack of evidence to support it, it has dramatically reshaped teacher education in the US. Using our framework, we identified the core foundations of the dominant accountability paradigm as market ideology and thin equity. I will explain each of those. Market ideology applied to teacher quality and teacher education can be summarized in three words. Teachers matter most when it comes to students' achievement, individual success, and a country's international economic competitiveness. This idea, as I'm sure many of you know, has been echoed relentlessly for years in the US and globally. In fact, it became a kind of global mantra that a country's economic health depends on its education system and that the quality of its education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers, assumptions that are very questionable. Second, we found that every one of the accountability initiatives we looked at had stated equity goals. But beneath the surface, we found that what we came to refer to as thin equity was the basis. Thin equity assumes that the unequal distribution of good teachers, good schools, good curriculum is the cause of inequality. And thus, that ensuring equal or the same access to these would create equity without necessarily challenging and changing the systems and structures that produce inequity in the first place. Thin equity is a really powerful concept because its advocates don't call it thin equity. They just call it equity. And it gives the appearance that inequality is actually being addressed while actually preserving the status quo. There is much more about all of these ideas in our lengthier um, book and other places. I'm just going to give you the highlights. So moving on, we found that the dominant accountability paradigm consistently framed the problem of teacher education and teacher quality as its failure to earn public confidence and trust, and its failure to develop as a bona fide profession because it doesn't have a system of continuous improvement based on collection of systematic data about impact, outcomes, and performance, and then using those data as the basis for improving practice and policy. According to the dominant accountability paradigm, the remedy for the problem is the creation of national data systems using uniform indicators, cutting edge assessment tools, and sophisticated data analytics, many of which reify test scores as the measure of effective teaching, while others zero in on the power of the market. The assumption 
is that holding teacher education accountable for impact and outcomes will let good programs rise to the top and force bad programs, which will be exposed, to either remediate or be excluded. Finally, let me look at the power relationships in the dominant accountability paradigm. This has to do with which professional organizations, government agencies, or other entities should have control and jurisdiction over teacher education, and how those in control define what teacher education should be accountable for. Given the deep mistrust of teacher education in the US, it's not surprising that control tends to be external to the programs and institutions being evaluated, with few opportunities for participants to help develop expectations or opt out of initiatives. Even with accountability initiatives purportedly created by and for the profession, and that language is used regularly, such as EdTPA and the CAPE professional standards, there have been multiple implementation and management issues that have transformed original intentions. In fact, there is mounting case study and survey research indicating that accountability that is supposed to be by and for the profession is increasingly experienced by programs and by institutions as externally imposed without regard for local knowledge local commitments, or professional judgments of teachers and teacher educators. In addition to our analysis of the dimensions of each accountability initiative, as I've just been talking about, we delved deeper it to answer this first question about where we are with teacher education accountability. So we also analyzed the evidence for all four of these major accountability initiatives in the US. Obviously, these are the same four that I've just been talking about. To do so, we ask two questions for each of the four. What claims do proponents of the initiative make about how the initiative will actually improve teacher preparation and thus help solve the teacher quality problem in the United States? And then, what evidence supports these claims. The first question gets specifically at the theory of change behind the initiative and its proponents' assumptions about how particular mechanisms actually operate to create change. The second involves the validity and reliability of the initiative as a policy instrument. That is, whether or not there is evidence that the initiative actually has the capacity to meet its stated aims. We have presented a detailed analysis of the evidence, and especially the lack of evidence, behind these initiatives in a policy brief that we published with the National Education Policy Center in 2016. And I can't go into all that detail here. I invite you to look at that if you're interested. In short, though, we found that across three of the four initiatives, there is little evidence to support claims about how the policy mechanisms would actually operate to improve programs. The irony, of course, is that while these policies call for teacher education programs to make decisions based on evidence, the policies themselves are not evidence-based. With the fourth initiative, which is EdTPA, there is some evidentiary support as a policy initiative. But there are also mounting concerns within the teacher preparation community, plus state implementation problems, suggesting that widespread implementation and professional acceptance will be very challenging to accomplish. Now, I've shared a lot of information in response to this first question. So just to summarize and conclude my discussion about where we are with teacher education accountability in the US, a dominant teacher education accountability paradigm has emerged 
based on deep mistrust of the profession and on theories of change that are not supported by strong evidence. The dominant accountability paradigm is characterized by market ideology, inequity, externally controlled monitoring schemes, and narrow definitions of effectiveness. This brings me to the second question. How did we get here? To answer this question, I want to step back and consider very briefly five policy, political, and professional co-occurring developments that contributed to the emergence of the dominant accountability paradigm and, I think, to its staying power. And I'm going to take these up one at a time. Unprecedented global attention to teacher quality, a relentless public narrative about the failure of university teacher education, teacher education conceptualized and treated as a policy problem, the teacher education establishment's own turn toward accountability, and education policy framed as the cure for inequality. So first is unprecedented global attention to teacher quality tied to neoliberal economics. The emphasis on accountability in teacher education emerged as part of the decades-long shift in the late 20th century that we are all familiar with, the shift from an industrial economy to a global knowledge economy. In the US and in many other places, the shift to a knowledge economy was also a shift to neoliberal economics, wherein individualism, free markets, and private goods took precedence over other goals. Underlying neoliberal ideology is a conceptualization of human beings as rational, individual, economic actors, which is consistent with the logic of human capital theory. The connection between teacher education accountability, human capital theory, and neoliberalism's emphasis on the individual as an economic actor is crystal clear in the work of Eric Hanischek, senior fellow at the conservative Hoover Institute and arguably the most influential economist in the area of public education policy in the US. For two decades, Hanischek has defined teacher quality very simply. He says, teacher quality is teachers who produce large gains in students' achievement. The absence of large gains in student achievement indicates the absence of teacher quality. For Hanischek, then, the key to effective education policy is obvious, accountability in the form of performance incentives for teachers and schools rather than policies that try to change school conditions, not even to mention policies that try to change social conditions. Now, I have no time here to offer an extensive critique of the assumptions underlying ne neoliberal economics, and I'm assuming that everybody here is pretty familiar with the wonderful work of scholars who have done that. For now, I want simply to say that a neoliberal and human capital approach to education policy ultimately undermines a democratic vision of society and that market ideology is inconsistent with democratic education, at least in the way I'm going to talk about it. And I'll come back to these ideas in the third part of this talk. A second influence on the dominant accountability paradigm is the continuous public narrative about the failure of US teacher education. And I'm going to uh, share with you a few themes in that failure narrative. Please note, I am reporting these, not endorsing them. So these are some of the themes in the failure narrative. Teachers having completed university preparation makes no difference in the achievement of students. Teacher education programs have a liberal, progressive bias, and they focus on touchy-feely self-awareness rather than objective knowledge. Alternate routes are superior and provide a policy model for improving teacher quality. 
Schools of education don't embrace the science of education. Teacher education isn't changing, despite years of reform. Reform should focus on what really matters for teacher quality, accountability for student outcomes and teacher effectiveness. There are many, many other examples that I could share. Probably, luckily, I don't have time because it's a pretty discouraging list. But as you've just heard, the failure narrative in the US is a potent concoction of contested empirical assertions, normative claims, hyperbole, and politics. But these became the rationale for many new accountability schemes designed to produce compliance and uniformity in teacher education programs. They also paved the way for the proliferation of alternate pathways for new nonprofit and for-profit providers and for test-only entry routes into teaching. It's important to note that the failure narrative built on the already strong international consensus I was talking about a minute ago, teachers matter most, a phrase, as I've mentioned, that was inflated and repeated endlessly in the policy world. But the highly seductive assertion that teachers are the most important factor in students' achievement is a double-edged sword. In the US, this assertion that teachers matter most lived alongside the received wisdom since at least the Nation at Risk report in 1983 that the schools were failing. The logic here is crystal clear. If teachers are the most important factor in students' achievement, and if US achievement is substandard, then teachers and the people who prepare them are to blame. Again, much of this is contested and will continue to be contested. But let me go to the third. The third influence on the emergence of the dominant accountability paradigm is teacher education defined as a policy problem focused on outcomes. When teacher education is defined as a policy problem, the goal is for policymakers to determine which of the broad parameters that they can control is most likely to enhance teacher quality and thus have a positive impact on desired outcomes. The Bush administration's No Child Left Behind Act intensified the policy approach to improving teaching and teacher education. But the wording of the Obama administration's Race to the Top guidelines, and this was a really important initiative because it determines state eligibility for federal funds following the global recession in 2008. Those guidelines made it clear that effective teachers were those who raised test scores. This signaled a shift to what, from what some have called teacher quality inputs, which include teachers' qualifications and characteristics, to outcomes, which focus on cl teachers' classroom performance career retention, and most controversial, evaluation of teacher education programs based on the graduates of those programs and their impact on the achievement scores of the students they eventually teach. And that is in place in many states. According to policy analyst Janelle Scott, it's not surprising that the perspectives underlying race to the top guidelines were consistent with market-oriented reforms. She points out that conservatives and neoliberals have dominated the framing of the problem of the schools in the US for decades. They characterize schools as wasteful, inefficient, and inattentive to results thus exacerbating the failed potential of students and protecting inefficient and overpaid teachers and school leaders, all resulting in the allegedly declining ability of the US to compete. Meanwhile, progressives' framing of the problem of schools, too much focus on test, 
unequal funding, unequal distribution of well-qualified teachers, a curriculum that doesn't include citizenship and democratic education, those framings have been marginalized. The teacher education establishment's own turn toward accountability is the fourth influence on the emergence of the dominant accountability paradigm. Although the US teacher education scene is complex, two national organizations have generally been regarded as the establishment. The National Council for the Accreditation of Teachers, or NCATE, which existed since 1950s, so that was in place for a very long time, and then its successor, CAPE, and the American Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, AACTE, which is a membership organization for teacher education institutions and deans. In 2000, NCATE announced new accreditation standards, <clears throat> which were described as a paradigm shift from inputs to outcomes because they required performance evidence about teacher candidates. In 2013, CAPE announced new standards, which demanded higher selectivity requirements for candidates and evidence of program impact and graduates' effectiveness. CAPE's new standards were very clearly intended to signal that it was getting tough and raising the bar regarding the preparation of teachers. The new standards were also intended to demonstrate, I think, that the organization was still relevant in the crowded teacher education field. Meanwhile, as critic Peter Taubman has suggested, the dean's institutional organization, AACTE, made a rush to support standards and accountability in the early 2000s, given the threat of privatization on one hand and withdrawal of government funding on the other hand. But I would also note here that AACTE was trying to walk a fine line between carrying the torch for the new accountability and questioning it in keeping with the concerns of some of its members. All of that having been said, today, the accountability discourse is pervasive and normalized, both within and outside the teacher education establishment. To be sure, most university teacher educators define outcomes more broadly than test scores. And many, myself included, object to preparation program evaluation based on the achievement of the graduate's eventual students. Nevertheless, it's now a fact of life in the US that teacher education focuses on outcomes. And there are far fewer questions about accountability per se than there used to be. The final factor in how we got here is that over time, US policymakers and others came to believe that poverty and income inequality could be remedied by education reform without reforms addressing other social, economic, and political conditions. In their analysis of the evolution of US social policy, policy historians Harvey Cantor and Robert Lowe argue that ever since the Lyndon Johnson presidential era, which was in the 60s, education reform, rather than a robust welfare state, was the favored solution to poverty and inequality in the US. They said this, the idea that inequality and poverty are susceptible to educational correction has reduced pressure on the state for other social policies that might more directly ameliorate economic distress. But because education's capacity to redistribute opportunity has been limited by the absence of social policies that directly address poverty and economic inequality, it has fueled disillusionment with public education itself for its failure to solve problems beyond its reach. So in other words, the belief that education reform could ameliorate inequality relieved policymakers of the burden for developing social policies 
which, coupled with education reform, actually, maybe, could have reduced inequality. This belief exacerbated disillusionment with public education and supported the turn away from the public schools. For teacher education, this belief ratcheted up what policymakers and the public expected from teachers and teacher educators. Increasingly, teachers were expected not only to provide a competitive labor force, but also to meet rising social expectations and help achieve social equity. The belief that education reform can eradicate inequality also led some to the conclusion that anyone who said teachers and schools alone, anyone who said they could not solve the nation's social problems were insiders who supported the status quo, who wanted to lighten their own workloads, and who were simply making excuses for the ineffectiveness of schools, teachers, leaders, and teacher educators. These five policy, political, and professional developments, I think, help explain the context and conditions within which the dominant accountability paradigm in US teacher education emerged and took hold. Collectively, they prompted a new common sense about teacher education and teacher quality. So what I mean by this is that the language and logic of accountability have become so deeply embedded in the everyday discourse and practice of teacher education that they are now very difficult to discern as policy and practice alternatives. Instead, they're often presumed to be self-evident and inevitable, more or less a kind of baked-in part of teacher education. As you know, the title of this talk is, if you remember the long title, is Reclaiming Teacher Education Accountability for the Democratic Project Now More Than Ever. Before I turn to question three, I'd like to say a few words about the now more than ever idea. So in the US, we're experiencing an extraordinary moment, actually many, many moments. <laughs> we, we have a president who, if he has any interest in education, appears to favor privatization and a market-based voucher system focused on many non-public school options, including for-profit arrangements. We have a billionaire secretary of education who has no experience as a student, teacher, or parent in public schools, who has a stunning lack of knowledge about and no commitment to public education, and who is shepherding quietly many policies that are eroding protection for minoritized groups that many people have worked for for many, many years. But we also have way bigger problems and deeper fault lines that are not unique to the US and were not invented or introduced by the Trump presidency, although it has dramatically exacerbated them. Across many developed countries, we have, as I mentioned earlier, growing income inequality, intergenerational poverty, and in almost every country, gaps in educational opportunities and outcomes between historically privileged and disadvantaged groups. Of course, the size of those gaps varies considerably from one country to another. We also have the emergence of a strong conservative nationalism, a backlash against immigrants and immigration policies, the acute polarization of people who are animated by deeply dissimilar values, including some people whose very values are defined by intolerance, even hatred, of conflicting viewpoints and the people who hold them. And in some countries, led by mine, I am ashamed to say, we have unprecedented and nearly 
unbelievable degrees of bigotry and contempt exhibited by people at the highest levels of leadership for diversity of every kind, political, geographic, demographic, philosophical, perspectival, linguistic, religious, sociocultural, socioeconomic, ethnic, racial, ability-based, and sexual orientation-based. Now more than ever, we need democratic education and democratic teacher education. Now more than ever, we need to reclaim accountability in teaching and teacher education for the democratic project. I want to be very clear here that I'm not suggesting we reject accountability, but rather that we reinvent it in a, as a lever for reconstructing teacher education's targets, purposes, and consequences in order to reclaim the profession for the democratic project. Now, I'm using the word reclaim here very deliberately. The background design for this slide by the way, is reclaimed wood, in case anybody's been wondering. I guess I've been trying to influence you subliminally <laughs> since the talk began with this visual reference to reclamation. So many definitions of the word reclaim focus on the idea of retrieving or getting something back that was previously lost or denied, like reclaiming your right to the throne, or they focus on getting something back that has been temporarily separated from the owner, like reclaiming your luggage. Other definitions highlight the idea of bringing a resource that was previously unusable into usable condition through cultivation or treatment, like reclaiming swampland or reclaiming water. But definitions of reclaiming also include the idea of rescuing something from an undesirable state or reforming something from wrong or improper conduct. So my use of the term reclaiming here to talk about accountability is closest to this latter sense. I explicitly want to rescue teacher education accountability from its current immersion in market ideology and the human capital paradigm. Those zero in on teacher quality narrowly defined based on the assumption that boosting teacher education quality will not only boost the quality of schools, but also a nation's place in the competitive global economy. I want to rescue teacher education accountability for democratic education, which not only prepares students who, for participation in democratic deliberation, but also identifies and works to eradicate the structures and systems that produce and reproduce inequity. With these goals in mind then, I want to turn to the third question. Where do we need to be? And to answer this, I am, and remember this is the normative question, to answer this I turn once again to our eight-dimensional framework. You remember that with the dominant accountability paradigm, I argue that the foundations are market ideology and thin equity. With democratic accountability, values are derived from democratic education theory, especially ideas related to strong democracy and strong equity. Democratic theory draws on thinkers like some of those pictured on this collage. A basic assumption is that in democratic societies, teaching and teacher education are values-oriented enterprises for the public good, rather than market-oriented enterprises based on competition for private goods. A major question here, of course, has to be, what kind of democracy are we talking about? I'm not talking about the kind of democracy that's more or less equated with market ideology. That is, democracy that mostly protects individual interests and property, and that values the freedom of the market above all other freedoms. Passive forms of democracy really don't do much more 
than protect individual freedom and property, which, by the way, is fairly typical of contemporary life in many so-called democratic societies, including the US. Rather, what I'm talking about, as Michael Engel put it, is democracy understood differently. That is, democracy that involves something well beyond people voting in elections and organizing special interest groups to lobby for their own viewpoints and their own advantages. I mean something more akin to Benjamin Barber's strong democracy, which is participatory, popular, and community-oriented. Here it's assumed that there is something called the public interest and the common good that is more than and different from the sum of people's individual self-interests. With strong democracy, there are always contested notions about public and private interests. So this means that strong democracy always needs to include debate about values and morals. There is way more here to say, but in the interest of time, the foundations of democratic accountability in teacher education are also based on strong equity. As my colleagues and I have conceptualized it, strong equity has four core ideas, and we've drawn here on work in political philosophy and a number of other areas. First is the redistribution to all schools of teachers who are committed to working with others for social change and who know how to teach students not only the core skills of literacy and numeracy, which of course are vital, but also how to advocate for themselves and how to engage in democratic deliberation. Second is recognition by teachers, school leaders, and policymakers of the school and societal structures and systems that reproduce inequity. This means it's not just teacher policies that have to be changed in order to interrupt inequity, but also policies related to housing, jobs, transportation, health, and early childhood services. This also includes recognition and representation of the values and knowledge traditions of minoritized students, families, and communities in the curriculum, in school practices, and in policies. Third is reframing powerful, prevalent frames related to equity, equality, and justice, especially ideas about colorblindness and meritocracy, which assume objectivity but mask the structural, economic, and racialized nature of inequality within a discourse of individualism and equal access. Access is not the sole answer to the achievement of strong equity. As Joyce King reminds us, equal access to a faulty curriculum, that is, one that doesn't include multiple knowledge traditions and aims, is not justice. Finally is the idea of resolving tensions. This has to do with acknowledging the inherent tensions and contradictions among competing ideas about equity and managing these in teacher education programs and more broadly in ways that are knowingly imperfect but concrete and local rather than glossing over all of this and talking at a fairly high level of abstraction, which I think is what often happens when we're talking about justice and equity. Accountability grounded in strong democracy and strong equity is intentionally disruptive. It frames the problem of teacher education differently and calls for different accountability solutions. So with the dominant accountability, as I hope I made clear, the problem of teacher education has consistently been framed as the failure of teacher education to produce a competitive workforce, primarily because the public and policymakers mistrust the profession because it lacks sophisticated data systems about outcomes. 
From the perspective of democratic accountability, the major problem is not lack of data. The problem is the dominance of the accountability paradigm itself and its negative effect on teacher education and teaching. We use the word subtractive here to describe this. Angela Valenzuela developed the phrase culturally subtractive to refer to the structural qualities of schools that subtracted or dismissed the social, cultural, and linguistic resources Mexican-American youth brought to school with them and thus relegated them to academic failure. We see the problem of teacher education as the subtractive impact of the dominant accountability paradigm. In the US, this paradigm has prompted compliance and uniformity. It's redefined how teacher educators think about their roles. It's emphasized narrow test-based or performance outcomes. It's de-emphasized local knowledge and local communities. And it's reduced the spaces in teacher education for discussion and action related to equity, social justice, and democratic education. With democratic education accountability, the solution to the problem is not data, it's the collective. Not just multiple teacher educators and teachers who do things differently, but teacher educators working with teachers and school leaders, families, communities, activists, advocates, multiple stakeholders, and policymakers, all trying to change the focus of education and accountability from tests, individual self-interest and private goods, to also include student citizenship and civic participation with a focus on the public interest, the common good, and the community. This can't be done just with teachers and teacher educators, although, of course, it cannot be done without them. The third aspect of democratic accountability has to do with power relationships, especially control. Here, instead of the dominant accountability paradigm focus on externally controlled monitoring schemes and narrow conceptions of outcomes and effectiveness, we propose the concept of intelligent professional responsibility. And this is derived from three ideas, intelligent accountability, professional accountability, and the distinction between responsibility and accountability. Onora O'Neill suggested that the audit culture in the UK public sector had resulted in lack of motivation, mistrust, and no actual improvement of people's work. She called instead for intelligent accountability that begins with trust and with the novel idea that the people who do the work in a particular area actually know something about it <laughs> and generally speaking, want to do it better. The second idea, again, there's much, much more to be said about all this. The second idea, professional accountability, was developed by Michael Fullen and colleagues, and they were talking about K-12 schools. They said, in order to support teachers and students' learning, external policymakers should concentrate not on imposing rules and regulations, but on creating the conditions for strong internal accountability. That is collective professional accountability within schools and school collaborators for the continuous improvement and success of all students. The distinction between responsibility and accountability has to do with the notion of obligation and imposition. Responsibility is chosen. Accountability is imposed. We drew on these three conceptions to develop for teacher education the idea of intelligent professional responsibility. As we see it, this is based on the dialogue and participation of all stakeholders in the teacher education enterprise, including the participants in local institutions and programs who are going to be held accountable, and the students, families, and communities who work with them. Dialogue, inclusion, and deliberation are key here. In terms of what 
teacher education programs are actually held accountable for with democratic accountability. Of course, teacher educators and programs would be responsible for teacher learning, teacher performance, and student learning. But these would be consistent with living in a democratic society in today's world. That means that student learning would include academic learning to be sure, but would also include social and emotional development, sense of well-being, civic engagement, critical thinking, problem solving, and democratic skills. In particular, in our divided society, this would need to emphasize respect, perspective taking, responsible disagreement, and deliberation through dialogue. Finally, with democratic accountability, the intended consequences would be heightened trust among participants, enhanced teacher and teacher educator professionalism, and deep responses to ongoing internal evaluations rather than the superficial responses that are often prompted by externally imposed evaluations. If there were time for a fourth big question, it would have to be, can we get there? There isn't time. But I want to note that we do offer in the book a number of promising practices in the final chapter. We talk about practices that work from the assumption that a major purpose of education is to prepare young people to participate in democratic deliberation, and that a major purpose of teacher education is to prepare teachers who can enact deliberative and critical democratic education. I, I call your attention to the nine promising practices that we cite at the end of the book. None of them is perfect. None of them is, here's the answer to democratic accountability. But each of them has features that we think are very important and are consistent with what we've talked about in terms of democratic accountability in teacher education. And one of the promising practices is the, Joe, tell me if I get the initials right, N-E-T-D-S, yes? Program here in Australia, and we are very pleased to include that. But since I don't have time for all of that, in conclusion, I want to just raise some questions about what it would look like and what it would take to reclaim teacher education accountability for democracy. What would state, national, or professional teaching standards look like if teachers were actually expected to teach students the skills of disagreement, deliberation, and perspective taking. What would preparation program accreditation look like if programs had to show evidence of democratic outcomes? What might countrywide reporting regulations include if the definition of teacher persistence didn't just mean whether or not teachers stayed in teaching, but included persistent efforts to challenge existing systems, school structures, and policies that help reproduce inequality. What advocacy groups, business interests, or philanthropists might invest their time and resources in reporting to the public the progress initial teacher education programs were making toward democratic ends. What if we recast teacher education accountability as the mutual, intelligent responsibility of all stakeholders based on commitment to the public good and to the democratic goals of deliberation, disagreement, and dialogue? What if we worked from the audacious assumption that accountability should serve democracy, not global competition and economic power for the elite. Now, more than ever, I think, we need to find out. Thank you.